Let me start by setting the scene and reveal to you how the revelation of a redeemer traces back to the genesis of creation. It was a dark episode in human history involving a serpent, Adam, Eve, and God. Though this scene is full of darkness and depravity, from this scene shines the greatest beacon of hope that the world would have ever known. God places Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and gives them one restriction, to not eat of the tree of good and evil. Though God gave them a restriction, he chose not to restrict their free will. In fact, he allows the catalyst of testing to be present in their presence. And there was the serpent, waiting, seeking to stain what was holy. And in one encounter, in one waver, in one collision, Satan's enticement and man's disobedience would collide, sending their existence into chaos and confusion, leaving them empty, lonely, and ultimately dead. It seemed as though darkness had won, but even so, there was still a promise hanging in the balance, a promise that seemed far too good to be true, a promise that seemed far too exaggerated for the human mind to comprehend, a promise that would overturn the tide of history in one moment and in one miracle, embedded within the ominous words of doom spoken by God himself was the promise, mankind's only hope, the promise of a seed. And see, this wasn't just any seed, but it was the seed, stamped with a capital S, the seed resonating the heartbeat of a savior, a deliverer, a messiah, who would come and have the final blow against the serpent who stained what was holy, crushing evil at its source and breathing life back into all that was barren. But first, first, all of humanity would endure the ache of a silence and the destruction of darkness. But there was still a promise that drew the shepherds and the prophets to their knees. Though it felt as though God put them on hold, they never ceased to cry out and call out, for they knew that God would flow down like rain in a drought. His glory would come because he was not a man that he would lie, nor would he change his mind, but he would do the impossible to ensure that his promise would abide, wrapped in love, no matter the balance on the payment, he would send down payment and and in one moment and in one miracle, at the cry of a newborn baby, the deafening sound of silence finally broke through the atmosphere. A star in the night sky became a roadmap to redemption wrapped in flesh. The promise arrived through a cosmic series of events. His word was kept. And see, he didn't descend as royalty on a throne, but he left royalty on a throne to become a baby in a manger born next to cattle, ox, and steed. It was his deed to become our Messiah in the midst of our mess. He drew open the heavens like a curtain split in two to become our answer from above because without him, we would be doomed. We were contaminated by a cancerous cell called death. No man had the cure. No potion would rid us of our position. We were slated, guilty as charged, with evidence sitting with Satan. There was no rebuttal, but there is now a redeemer. For our only response is holy, 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 for it flows from our lips like a broken record as we witness the beginning of an eternal story. See, he is not just a baby in a manger. No, but he is the hope of the heavens made alive in our presence. He is Jesus. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us, the promise who was and is and will always be.
Christmas, church, I can think of no better way to start out than we'll praise the name of Jesus forever. Amen. Amen. Well, listen, we're going to keep worshiping, but as we do so, if you have any seats next to you, you can squeeze your way in towards the aisle. That would be helpful as people are still coming in to worship with us. Listen, we're going to keep singing, but this is my encouragement to us all. Let's truly find the joy of Jesus in these songs that we've heard for years as we continue to praise him now and we continue to sing here today. Come on, join with us.
watch over the room just to close your eyes in this moment and just receive this truth, this word. This is from John chapter one, verse four. In him was life and the life that was the light of men. And this light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And we on this side of the cross get to say it never will. I wanna invite you to go ahead and stand to your feet. Our host team's gonna come forward. As you came in, you were handed a candle. Go ahead and grab that. Because we're gonna have a moment here. And as the host team helps you do that on the ends of the rows, if those with the unlit candles, you do the leaning. Just a little pro tip there. But as your candle's being lit, something that I just wanted us to do in light of that scripture is just that reminder, even if it means as we continue to sing, you wanna just look down at that light. Maybe look around the room and just see all the lights coming on. But it's just representation of Jesus. What I love about that though is we're singing about a light that can never be overcome by the darkness. The source of all light, source of our hope, our salvation. And so as we sing, we're adoring and praising our Savior. We invite you to sing along with us as we continue to praise.
light is that we sing. We thank you for the light that will never be overcome by the darkness. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Y'all can carefully blow your candles out. We invite you to have a seat. Well, this is truly the most wonderful time of the year. And as you know, it's just a time of giving. It's a time of peace. It's a time of joy. It's a time of celebration. And it's, it's a time for family. Hopefully you've had some wonderful time with your family. But it's also a time of anticipation. I remember when our sons were, were younger, our sons Taylor and Zach were, were they're very little. And, and they would often, on Christmas morning now, they would oftentimes wake us up at, at five in the morning, sometimes four in the morning. Anybody know what can relate? And, and, and they would come into our room just desperately wanting to go downstairs so they could tear into what they hoped was under the Christmas tree. And Amy and I, who had only had a, almost every year just a couple hours of sleep, we would send them back to their beds and we'd say, guys, just, just give us an hour or two. It's just not quite time yet. And that extra hour seemed like an eternity to them because just as soon as we would drift off back to sleep, we would hear one of them yell out from their room, is it time yet? And we'd be like, just no, but the anticipation was just too much for them to handle. Let's go back in history for a moment, if you would, and imagine what it was like for the nation of Israel as they waited for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years with great anticipation for the promised Messiah. Let me, let me set the scene for you. When Jesus came to earth as a baby over 2,000 years ago, the world was not much different than it is today. There was, there was uncertainty, there was turmoil, there was distress, there was a lot of gloom. The nation of Israel was, was being controlled by Rome. Caesar Augustus was the emperor at the time. The people of Israel were being taxed very heavily by the Romans. The king of, in Jerusalem at the time was, was Herod, who out of paranoia and, and jealousy was murdering several of his friends and family members. There was fear and anxiety that was sweeping throughout Jerusalem and all throughout Israel and the people were, were ready for peace. There was, there was anticipation. The people were, they were waiting for God's promised Messiah to come to the, into the world to free them from the Romans, to deliver them from Herod and to, to bring peace into their lives once and for all. And so they would gather in their synagogues and, and they would listen to their, their priest read prophecies that were written hundreds and hundreds of years ago that had been recorded in Old Testament days. And, and they especially leaned in with hope when a priest would, would unroll the ancient scrolls of the Old Testament and, and he would read from the prophet Micah. And the words would read like this. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old from ancient days, therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. When Micah wrote those words, the Jewish people would have had to have wait would have to wait 700 years for that promise to become reality. Imagine the anticipation. This was their hope. And so they waited with expectancy. They were just hanging on every word. Well, one night in the little town of Bethlehem, that promise became reality. Listen to how the New Testament writer Luke describes it in Luke 2.7. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths. And laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And at the same time that that was going on, Luke tells us in verse 8 that in that same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the, store, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Out of all the special moments in the Christmas story, the story of the shepherds is certainly one of my favorites. I love the fact that the first invitation that God sent out to come and see the newborn Savior went to the shepherds. Now if you know anything about these shepherds, then you'll know that they were the social outcast of society because 
They worked with animals. They, their work was, was seem, uh, deemed to be ceremonially unclean. And so they were not welcomed into the temple. In other words, you weren't going to be able to bring them to church. And because there was not a lot of money in being a shepherd, anytime something would get stolen, guess who, guess who got blamed first? These guys, the shepherds. And Luke tells us that, that these shepherds lived out in the field. That means that, that they would have been tough, calloused individuals. And yet out of all of the people living in Israel that God could have chosen to first reveal the birth of his son, he chose the shepherds. Now that might surprise you tonight, but it really shouldn't. Because the story of the shepherds is just confirmation for why Jesus came to earth. He came for the spiritually lost. He came for the sinner. He came for the hopeless, the poor, the outcasts of society. He came for those who felt forgotten, those who felt overlooked or maybe pushed aside. And these shepherds are just a beautiful picture of who Jesus came to save. I mean, think about it. On the outside, most of us here today, we don't resemble the shepherds. None of you have a herd of sheep parked outside the building here today. At least hopefully you don't. And and you're not dirty and grubby looking. All of you smell nice. But on the inside, before we experienced God's grace and we received his mercy and salvation, we were just like these men. Our hearts were dirty. We were spiritually lost with no hope for the future. Like the Israelites, like the shepherds, we were people in desperate need of, 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 of peace and hope. And yet, here's one of the things that I love about this story and these guys. Out of all of the characters in the Christmas story, God revealed to them the, entr- the entrance of his son into humanity with the most clarity and the most fanfare. I mean, think about it for a moment. The shepherds were visited by not just one angel, but eventually a whole whole company of angels. I mean, think of how awesome that would have been. God rolled out a huge display of his glory for these guys. And you think about that and you go, isn't that just like God? Doesn't doesn't that just confirm in your heart why Jesus came to earth? And isn't it so consistent with God's character? I mean, think about all of the people that God chose to use throughout the pages of the Bible. The, The father of the nation of Israel, Abraham, was just a leader of a band of rovers. Old Testament Joseph was a slave and a prisoner. Moses was an outcast, a murderer, and a slave. Rahab, who, who falls in the, the genealogy of, of Jesus, the Savior, she was a prostitute. Gideon, the great Israelite judge, was a man who, who struggled desperately with fear. Israel's greatest king, David, was an adulterer. He was a murderer. He was a liar. Not a great father. Esther was an orphan. Joseph the earthly father of, of Jesus came from a, a place called Nazareth. He was a, a young carpenter. At some point in the scriptures, someone looked and said, who, who in the world, what, could, what good could come out of Nazareth? And yet that was the dad that God chose for Jesus. And then Mary, a teenage girl. And now these guys, the outcasts of society, the shepherds. And here today, some of you, you may feel overlooked. You may feel like life has pushed you to the side that... that, that you've been forgotten about. Some of you have been waiting for a long time with great anticipation for a promise from God to become a reality. And the story of the shepherds should remind you today that God has not overlooked you and he's not forgotten about you. God has a, he has a plan and a purpose for your life and he wants to use you in a significant way. And I want you to know today that his track record of keeping his promises is flawless. Well, how did the shepherds respond to this invitation to come and see Jesus? Well, first of all, they were filled with fear. Luke doesn't just say they were filled with just fear. He says they were filled with great fear. In other words, these guys were terrified. They were in distress. And who wouldn't be, right? I mean, how many of us have ever had a face-to-face encounter with an angel covered with the glory of the Lord? And these guys are just out there minding their own business, watching over their flock. And all of a sudden, an angel appears and they're shocked. They're blown away. They're scared to death. But I love how the angel responds to to their distress. The angel says, Fear not, because I'm here to bring you good news of great joy. And it's not just good news for a handful of people, for a chosen group of people, or for you know, people of a certain race, or of a certain skin color, or, or, or a certain class of society. No, this is good news that will be for all the people. Over in Bethlehem, in the city of David, a Savior has been born for you. And he is Christ the Lord. Listen, I don't want you to miss the importance of every word that this angel said to these shepherds. 
He says, not only is this wonderful news for all the people, but this Savior that was born was born for you. I want you, if you could, just to let that sink in for just a moment. Today, a Savior has been born for you. Now imagine how completely astonished and amazed these shepherds must have been by this very personal announcement. I mean, after all these years of of hearing prophecies from the Old Testament writers and waiting for Israel's Messiah to come, he's finally come to earth. And the announcement of his birth was not given to the wealthy, it was not given to the political, it was not given to the religious leaders of the day, but instead it was given to a group of humble shepherds. And he would be a Messiah for all the people and eventually he would be offered as a sacrificial lamb, just like those that were being cared for by the shepherds. And to confirm his words, the the angel told the shepherds where they would find this baby. Verse 12, Luke says, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. This newborn king wasn't, wasn't lying in a palace crib wrapped in fine linens, but instead in a, in a manger, most likely lying on straw in a cave where animals were kept. And the angel said the baby would be found wrapped in swaddling cloth. Now, have you ever just stopped for a moment and thought about that? Have you ever just wondered why Luke would include the detail that Jesus was wrapped in strips of cloth or as many of us have heard before, swaddling clothes? Because it just seems a little bit odd, doesn't it? I mean, when you invite someone to to come to your house for the first time or, you know, know, to see your newborn baby, I mean, you don't make a big proclamation when they come in the door. You'll recognize the child when you go down the hallway to the right. This baby, he'll be wrapped tightly in a diaper. You don't do that, right? None of us do that, right? But why was this information important? I mean, think about who the angel was talking to here for a moment. He's talking to shepherds. And here's a fun fact. The shepherds were responsible for for providing lambs for the Jewish priests to make sacrifice for the sins of the Jewish people. The shepherds had to make sure that these newborn lambs had no defects since according to Old Testament law, the sacrificial animals had to be without spot or wrinkle. And so the shepherd would tightly wrap the lambs in cloth to keep them from becoming blemished or injured. And since at his birth, Jesus was the sinless lamb of God that would sacrifice his life to take away the sins of the world. This explains why Luke would make a point for us to know that Jesus was wrapped in strips of cloth. Well, I love what happens next. Even though the the shepherds were overwhelmed with fear by the angel's presence, when the angels invited them to come and see the newborn savior, they They acted in faith. Look at verse 13. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. When the shepherds heard the the message of the angels, Luke says, they they went to Bethlehem with haste. In other words, in spite of their fear, they acted in faith and they just, they took off immediately to find the baby. We don't don't know who was left to look out for the sheep. If they were just left to fend for themselves, we don't know what was going on. But we know these shepherds wanted to see for themselves what the angels had told them about. They were not going to let doubt or fear stop them from being part of this monumental moment. I mean, think of all of the different ways that these guys could have responded to the angels. I mean, they could have just said, hey, guys, let's build a fire, pull up some logs, get out your stringed instruments and flutes because we're going to have a worship service right now. We're, we're, we're just going we're gonna, to we're gonna sing about how beautiful the angels are, how warm and fuzzy it makes us feel inside when they were speaking to us and how that angelic message just rescued us from our doubts and fears. Or they could have gone out to the Bethlehem Starbucks and analyzed the angel's message. And they could, have, they could have debated with each other over whether it was theologically sound and they could have gone back and forth with somebody on Twitter, right? Or they could have just shaken the whole thing off and done nothing. They could have just turned down the incredible invitation to come and see the newborn king and just blown it off. But fortunately, they didn't do any of those things. Instead, they realized that God was in the story and he was clearly at work in an animal stable somewhere in Bethlehem. And by faith, they left their flocks and they ran to town to find this baby. Listen, we have no idea how they found the exact location of the cave where Jesus had been born. The Bible doesn't tell us that. But here's what we know. 
when they found him, they became believers. Luke doesn't describe the moment when these men became Christ followers, when they were saved, when they received salvation, when they were born again. Each one of these men had to, they had to make an individual decision that was very personal and very unique to them. But here's what happened. The moment they laid eyes on him, they knew in their hearts that he was the Messiah. He was the, the promised son of God. They knew that they were sinners and that their savior was, was a newborn baby lying right in front of them. And they believed that if they put all of their faith and their trust in the Savior, that he had the ability, this baby had the ability to forgive them of their sins and rescue them from an eternity without God. You say, Brian, how do you know that, that that's what these men did? Well, look at what they did next. Look at verse 17. It says, and when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child and all who heard it wondered at the shepherds, wondered at what the shepherds told them. In other words, they told everybody now, now, if you're a lowly shepherd and the streets of Bethlehem are crowded with people, you're, just, you're probably not going to be running up to people all over the place unless you, your life has truly been changed, unless your world has just been rocked. You've seen the promise Messiah. I mean, picture these guys walking up to one person after the next, grabbing one person after the next, sharing what the angel had told them and what they had seen. I mean, th these guys are sharing their faith with anybody that would listen. They became the very first street evangelists. And remember for just a moment who they are. They're the outcasts of society. They're, they're the rough and dirty. They probably smelled like sheep. And yet Luke tells us that everyone that heard the message were absolutely amazed because these men had been changed from the inside out and they would never be the same again. This encounter of faith with this little savior changed their lives forever. Where there may have been fear and spiritual uncertainty and confusion, now there was confidence and assurance. Where, where there was once doubt and distress, now there was peace and inward joy. And I love how Luke just, he takes a, just a moment away from the shepherd's story to describe how Mary, Jesus' mother, was handling all of this. In verse 19, Luke says, but Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. This young teenage girl had just given birth to the Savior of the world. And Luke tells us that she quietly reflected on everything that was happening. The New Living Translation translates it to say that she kept all these things in her heart and she thought about them often. Mary, I mean, think about this. She had to be exhausted a teenage girl who, who went from Nazareth to Bethlehem on a donkey, 90 miles. Joseph, a young, young man, probably mo walked most of the way. She, and here she had given birth to her very first child. And now she gets a chance to see firsthand the impact that her son was having on the world. And the Bible says she just, she, she pondered this in her heart. She thought about it often. I remember when Taylor and Zach were born. Taylor was born in Virginia. Zach was born here in Georgia a year after we moved here. And I remember for those people that came up to the hospital to see both of our, our boys, it was back in the, the days when you, you would walk up to a glass and there'd be just babies all lined up in rows, in little cribs. Remember? I think they still do that. And maybe not. But, but I remember standing at the, at the window and just in amazement. I mean, I'm just looking at my son and these little hands and, these, and I'm just like, it's, I was blown away by God, just, Lord, how these little fingers work and these little toes work. And someone would walk up to me and they would say, which one is yours? And I would go, that one right there. And they'd say something like, you know what I mean, like, like the, the little one that's screaming and crying with a wrinkled face. No, 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 the calm one with the smooth skin and all the muscles. That's my guy right there. And, they, and I pondered those things in my heart. No, but I would just, I mean, I just remember standing there staring at the miracle of a newborn baby. Because it really is a miracle. It's just such an amazing gift of God. And I think about how Mary must have just felt reflecting on the impact that her son at this very moment as a little baby was having on the world, on the streets of Bethlehem. You know what these shepherds did next? They became worshipers. Verse 20 says, And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. These guys went back to work as changed men, glorifying and praising God for what they had experienced and what had just taken place in their lives. Listen, they went back to the same old fields. They went back to the same old sheep, but they went back different men. 
They were still the outcasts of society because of their profession, but in God's eyes, they were now accepted into his family. They probably still had moments where they, where they felt lonely and they felt forgotten by the rest of the world, but now they were part of a small group of brothers who had been with them, who, who, who could encourage each other because of how, how Jesus had changed each one of their lives. And on the outside, they probably still smelled like sheep, but on the inside, they had been washed white as snow. These men went back to their job of tending sheep, but Luke tells us that they went back grateful for everything that had happened to them because their lives would be changed forever. And they glorified and praised God. And it just all began with a simple invitation. Come and see this newborn Savior who's been born just for you. He is Christ the Lord. Today, I I want you to know that that very same invitation that the angels first shared with the shepherds has now been extended to every single one of you. And the question is today, is how will you respond to Jesus? I want to challenge you to respond in the same way the shepherds responded to the invitation. For some of you, I want to ask you, would you you come and see the Savior? Would you come and see him? For some of you, it'll be the first time. And I know in a room like this, there's there's people who are, you're, you're hearing all that I'm saying. And for some of you, you're skeptical. I understand. For some of you, you're, you're fearful, a little bit like the shepherds. You're like, well, if I make a decision to, 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 to follow the Savior, what, what's going to happen to me next? And maybe there's some doubt and fear and some apprehension inside of you. Some of you walked in here tonight feeling hopeless. Some of you walked in today feeling completely lost. When Jesus grew up to become a man and he started his, his early ministry in the age of 30 or so, he was standing in front of a large crowd and Matthew captured these words in Matthew 11, where Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and who are carrying heavy burdens. And he says, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear. And the burden I give you is light. When the shepherds were invited to come and see Jesus, listen, there wasn't a list of religious rules posted on the, on the manger or, out, or an outside wall of the cave where the animals were. There was just an opportunity to believe that this baby was the son of God. And I want you to know it's the same thing today. Jesus says, come to me. I'm inviting you. Come to me, all of you. All of you who have heavy burdens on you. He says, "My my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In other words, receiving forgiveness and salvation is not about following an impossible list of religious rules. It's about believing with all of your heart that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Savior. He is the Son of God. And in just a moment, I'm hoping that you will make that decision to come and see the Savior and to put your faith and trust in Jesus for the first time. For others of you, we need to go and share what what we've seen and heard, what God has done in our lives through salvation and Jesus Christ. Listen, it needs to be shared with the whole world. It needs to be shared with our friends and our family. It needs to be shared with our whole community. This is how Jesus said it and Mark recorded it in Mark 16. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. It's a message that's been given to everyone. And so we need to preach the message to everyone. Like the shepherds, listen, we have a message to share. We have a story to tell. And we have to tell it. Jesus commands us to tell it. And I don't know about you, but some of you may be sitting here thinking, I don't know what to say. I don't know a lot of Bible. I I have no idea what I would say. Listen, you do actually. Think about this fact. The shepherds, they didn't have John 3.16 memorized. They didn't have several verses out of the book of Romans to memorize the Romans road to share with people. None of that had even been written yet. What they simply shared out on the streets of Bethlehem was just what they had seen and heard. And the angel called it good news. And and people were amazed by it. Listen, we live in a world that desperately needs some good news right now. We're living in a time period when hatred and disunity just is running rampant throughout society. And if we're truly the followers of Jesus, the Messiah, then we know that peace on earth is not going to come through whoever might be the next great political leader or whoever might become a human king. I mean, if that were true, then God would have sent one of those to us to save us, to rescue us. But that's not what God chose to do. And listen, that's not why we find our, that's not where we find our hope today. We find our hope in Jesus, the savior of the world. And so for all of us, all of us, let's come and worship him. Let's come and worship Jesus. What does that mean? It means so many things. But if you're already a a Christ follower, here's what I want to 
ask you to do today. Would you open your heart to his love for you? For some of you, I know it's been a while maybe since you've been here or you've been in any church, but you know that you're a follower of Jesus. You remember a moment or a time in your life where you truly put your faith in Jesus alone to save you and and yet maybe for whatever reason your heart has gotten cold, it's gotten calloused. Can I tell you that God's never stopped pursuing you? He has never stopped. He's never given up on you. He's not, he's not for one moment let up on pursuing you with his love. And would you open your heart to his love today? For some of you, would you surrender yourself to his will for your life? We spend so much of our time trying to find purpose and meaning outside of Christ, outside of what he has for us. And it's just an empty road. I spent years of my life doing that. For some of you, that may be where, maybe it's maybe where you are today. I want to encourage you, just give your life to his will, to his plan for your life. There's not a, a more fulfilling, promising pursuit. And regardless of where you are today, would you let your heart just be filled with awe and adoration for what he's done for all of us, for what he has done for you? If you are here today and you've never put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ alone, to be your personal Lord and Savior. I want you to know that he came to earth over 2,000 years ago and he was born for you. He is Christ the Lord. If you're the only person in this whole world that had ever existed, he still would have given his life for you. I want us to ask all of us just to bow our head for just a moment. And if you've never received God's gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, if you've never put your faith and your trust in him alone, if you're not quite sure where your eternity would be, if you were to slip away today out of this life into the next, I wanna just give you that moment to receive what God is offering you to here today, to come and see the Savior, to receive salvation into your life, to be forgiven of sin. If you don't know what to do, just pray with me for a moment. Just say, Lord, in faith I come to you right now and I put all of my hope and all of my trust and all of my faith in Jesus. He didn't stay a a baby. He he grew up to be a man and he gave his life for me on a cross. He took my place on a cross, gave his life for mine. And today, I put all of my faith and all of my trust in what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross. I can't work to earn forgiveness. And so I put all my hope and trust in what Jesus did and I need forgiveness, I ask you to forgive me my sin. And with my mouth, I confess that Jesus Christ is the Savior, he's the Son of God. Thank you today for saving me. If you just prayed that prayer with me, I want you to just quietly look at me for a moment. I want you to get out your phone, okay? This may seem a little odd, but it works. Get out your phone, I want you to text the word FOLLOW to 770-222-2125. Text the word follow to 770-222-2125. We want to follow up with you. This is the biggest, the greatest decision you've ever made in your life. I'm listening, more important than, than who you're going to marry, more important than, than, than having kids, more important of where you went to college, more important than who you're pulling for in the next bowl game. It, it's, it is the decision that defines where you'll spend eternity, who will walk with you through the rest of this life, who will give you hope for tomorrow. And we want to help you to take your next step in being a follower of Jesus. Listen, as we close out, would you look at me for a moment, all of you. As we close out today, let's worship the shepherd. Let's worship the Savior like the shepherds did. Let let your heart be filled with wonder and awe and adoration. Let Let him become beautiful to you. Let's praise our Savior, the King of kings, who left the glories of heaven to be born in a manger. Let's praise the perfect lamb who gave his life for us on on the cross and who defeated death and is alive with us today and lives inside of us today. I want to ask you to stand. I want to just ask you, if you don't know this song, you can just just enjoy the words, reflect on it, just let Christ be be beautiful to you, just adore him. You're here today and you're charismatic. Listen, raise your hands with everything you got, both of them. If you're Baptist, you can put one down, you can raise just one. Okay, if you're Presbyterian, you can do this. We we got you covered, okay? Lutheran, you're good, all right. If you're Catholic, you can just do this. It's good. You're welcome here, okay? Everybody's welcome here to to worship the Savior, right? Westridge, Merry Christmas. And know this as you walk out here, here today, you are loved. Every one of you, you are loved. But before you leave, let's worship together. Jason.
darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a crane